So this is the last Sunday of Easter, according to the lectionary, which we teach through, as you know, at Church One. And it's as if the authors who picked the scriptures for this week of the lectionary decided to give us this gift of one more week of looking at one more facet in that diamond of the resurrection and the cross of Christ. So that's what we're going to do through the readings in 1 Peter today. We're going to look at the suffering of Christ on the cross, and we're going to look at our suffering, and hopefully we're going to understand a little bit about how those two things can come together in our lives. Anytime um, somebody teaches on a topic, you sort of look at that topic from a lot of different angles. So in thinking about suffering over the last few weeks, I thought about, one of the things I thought about, and I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes, is just the stupid things people say to you, sometimes when you're suffering. And that sort of line of thinking thought me, led me to this thought of stupid things I've just said to my children in general over the years. And there's a lot of them, of course, for all of us. We have received a lot of stupid things, and we then pass them on. <laughs> but um, in a moment of maybe delirious humility, we, my husband and myself, decided to ask our kids give them the opportunity to say, what are some of those dumb things we've said to you over the years? And we actually had a fun and laughter-filled conversation about um, our proclivity to hyperbole that happens in the Batley family. Words like always and never are thrown around on a daily basis. We also had a nice conversation about calling a child into a room and then forgetting why you needed them <laughs> in that room. Um, and then my husband told this wonderful story, which my mother and father-in-law are here, and I welcome them this morning, but it's actually about his father, and I got permission to tell it. But uh, when Mike was a little boy, he'd be in the basement. You can picture him watching Star Wars or something, one of his favorite. And his father would call up from the basement and sound something like this, Mike! And Mike would trudge upstairs, not wanting to leave his TV show that at the time you couldn't put on pause. Um, and he would, and his dad would be pointing to a pair of shoes and he'd say, that are on the steps, and his father would say, what are these? And this is, I think a lot of comedians are frustrated children that can't say the funny things that come to their mind, but in Mike's mind, he would think, shoes? Um, but he'd say, nothing. And his dad would say, what are they doing here? And again, in Mike's mind, he would think, sitting on the steps. Um, but anyway, as Mike told this story to our children, they not only laughed, but they looked at Mike and they said, that's exactly what you do to us all the time. And it's just so funny when you think of something in your own life that you don't pass it on, and we pass this stuff on all the time. But talking about suffering, I'm, it's just not an easy thing. And it, it, with one person, with 50 or 100, because suffering is not an easy thing. And I think if you look at suffering from a scientific, an academic, a theological, any angle, you run the risk of mitigating someone's pain. You run the risk of saying, I'm going to put suffering under a microscope and try to understand it, and I'm going to try to tell you what God thinks of it. <laughs> if you ever want to understand what God thinks of us thinking about suffering, what he thinks, just read the book of Job. You'll understand that whatever we think, we're wrong if we're trying to justify or understand suffering from his point of view. Um, so it, you just run the risk of not handling it correctly. And I felt the weight of that this last couple weeks. I just felt the weight of wanting to accurately. But fortunately, the scripture that we're given today um, is a, an incredible guide in 1 Peter. So I'm just going to talk about Peter, because you know when I teach, I like us to understand context. So if we're studying 1 Peter, we first have to understand a little bit about Peter to understand a little bit more about his words. Peter was an enthusiastic, strong-willed, impulsive, and at times brash disciple of Christ. He was a natural-born leader. He became the kind of the de facto spokesman for all of the disciples frequently. Peter was the first one to confess and excitedly confessed, if you can read it kind of between the lines in the New Testament. But he was the first one to say, Jesus, he's my Lord, he's it, he's the Savior. Interestingly, he was the first one to deny that very same Lord and Savior. It was Peter who left the boat to walk on the water out of his excitement and impulsivity to be with Jesus. 
It was the same Peter who sank in the water when he began to doubt. It was Peter who took aside Jesus himself to rebuke Jesus for the way Jesus was talking about his death. He was not afraid. It was Peter who drew his sword. Remember that scene? And attacked in the garden? Attacked the high priest. So it's Peter and this apostle, that same impulsive, excited follower, leader, follower for Christ, who um, wants the church that he's writing in Asia Minor. He wants them to understand that suffering is inevitable. And he longs for his readers to understand a few things about suffering. A couple things that he repeats over and over in the book are he wants them to remain in suffering. He wants them to remain steadfast throughout their suffering. He wants them to endure with patience their suffering. And he begins the book talking about how they can rejoice in suffering, and he ends the book with the passage we're going to look at today, how they can rejoice in their suffering. And he gives us some great reasons why. And it's only in just a few little nuggets of words, which I love. 1 Peter 12, um, contain, the, all, of 1 Peter, all of 1 Peter contains 12 verbs with the words to suffer, 12 connotations of the word to suffer. All of the New Testament, to put those 12 words into perspective of the whole New Testament, there's only 42 places in the New Testament where you'll find authors talking about suffering. So just shy of one-third of all of the New Testament teaching on suffering is found in 1 Peter. So this is one of his, in a sense, it's one of the gifts of this book. It's not a book on how to suffer at all. It's a book on understanding suffering. So I think, again, before we're getting there, we're going to get to the passage in one minute, but in order to understand suffering, you have to kind of look at how, and we're going to use Peter's illustrations of how, what suffering is, because there's different kinds of suffering. One suffering is from spiritual oppression. This is the kind of suffering some people would call spiritual battle. Some people would call, we, we live in enemy, enemy territory, some people would say, and this is, and because we live in an enemy territory for a season, we're going to suffer. Some people call that spiritual battle. Peter actually talks very little about that kind of suffering in this book. So his teaching is not contained necessarily in that context, although he admits it's a very real part of suffering. And there's also the kind of suffering that just results from us growing up in an unjust world, a disease-filled world, a world filled with things in a way that aren't the way they should be. There's just suffering. We have bosses that are narcissistic and care about themselves, and there's suffering related to that. We play on lacrosse teams, and our coach never picks us to play. And he's not fair. It's unjust, but it's part of living in this world. Um, He talks a little bit about that kind of suffering in this book, but by far, by and large, the kind of suffering he's talking to and referring to in 1 Peter come from two places. One is the fact that we bear the name of Christ. As believers in Christ, we will suffer. The second is, the transformation, that our lives are changing and becoming more like the person of Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. Wait till next week for that, because that's Pentecost Sunday. Again, this is the last Sunday we're looking more at the resurrection. But our lives are changing and transforming before us, and that is an offense to those around us. And somehow in that, we will suffer. And Peter's words in both 1 Peter 1 and 1 Peter 4, which I think is going to go up on the screen any minute, is rejoice. One of the reasons he says that we can rejoice is that we... um, Hold on one second, I want to make sure. Yeah. One of the reasons he says we can rejoice is he's just... So this is from 1 Peter 4, 12. But in 1 Peter 4, 1 to 11, just preceding this, He goes through some ways that these believers are now at this place of understanding why you suffer. And one of the reasons, he says, is you're living out of your gifting. And because of that, you're going to suffer. I thought a lot about my children when I thought about this scripture of living out of your gifting and suffering, because a couple of my kids have the gift of mercy. And like any of the spiritual gifts God has given us, they come with a weight, a privilege, and a responsibility. And to have the gift of mercy, those of you, I don't have the gift of mercy, but I can recognize it because it's in my kids. 
but you know, I have a good friend that does, um, and you know that that comes with this weight of seeing the pain in people. And in a sense, identi mercy, identifying with that. My children have, um, since they could speak, have wanted to do as much as they can for homeless. They just were born. God put the spirit in them. My eldest son, Connor, um, I, I think I've told this story before, but I'm just going to tell it again. We were, because it's part of today. We were driving um, home from Boulder, Colorado. We had just bought, we lived outside of Boulder. We had just bought a, a loaf of whole wheat bread at the Great Harvest Bread Company, the greatest bread in Boulder. Um, it was warm. You could still smell it in the car. It was on the seat between us. We were listening to Shania, Shania Twain on our Dustbuster minivan with the windows open on a low humidity Colorado spring day. And we're pulling off the highway, this loaf of bread between us, and we pull up and there's not only a homeless man, but like a a pain-filled eyes, haggard. And I'm not sure Connor and I talked. He was six, we had a couple more kids in the back seat, jamming to the radio, but I think he looked at me, and we both looked at the bread, and he looked at me, and he's like, like, there's no choice. <laughs> like, really, Mom? And I'm thinking, I love this bread. <laughs> Just being honest. And so Connor grabs the bread and hands it to the guy. He's been doing this for... for the 15 years since then. So Connor's home this week. I got permission from him to tell this story too. And to his humility, he did not want, want me to tell it. But he's home this week and ran his bike, dad's bike into the bike shop, which was broken. And he's leaving the bike shop. He's in Reisterstown and he sees an entire homeless family. And he just, Connor knows himself well enough to know, I'm gonna, this isn't easy. I'm, I, I'm gonna wanna help him. I don't have any cash on me, typical college student. Um, but I'm gonna wanna do something. And so I'm gonna go around him. Well, traffic, however it worked, people, he couldn't go around him. So he was faced with him, and he, and he has, of course, has this conversation. He's like, look, man, I don't have any cash, and what do you want? I'll go buy a pizza. He offers to go buy the people pizza, and he quickly assesses their needs and goes and get them a gift card to just meet their needs. In telling me the story, he's just telling the story at dinner with Quinn and I, and he just starts crying at dinner. He goes, Mom, I was weeping in the car. And I thought, hey, you know, I said to him, Connor, you've been like this since you were two. It's the gifting of God in your life. It's, it comes with responsibility. It comes with suffering. But it's not suffering without hope. It's suffering that, that, that recognizes this is what I was made for. And this is, there's a weightiness to it. And so Peter gives us this incredible gift. And it's just a couple words. And if you don't read this in the NRSV, you might miss it, because in the NIV, in different translations of the Bible, don't get caught up in my mumbo-jumbo, but some translations will say, do not be surprised, beloved. Some, some translations will say, at the painful ordeal you're going through. It's actually very inaccurate, the painful ordeal. It's a fiery ordeal that is taking place. Do not be surprised at those moments in life where you are faced with any kind of suffering. Don't be surprised. Why? Why is it so important that it's the word fiery and not painful? Why, why am I caring so much about the accuracy of God's word? There's not a commentator out there that would disagree that it's fiery, just so you know. Um, the reason why is the fiery word here, the word for fiery or derail is the word periosis. I'm probably saying it wrong. And it's the word that is referred to, and the term is drawn from the intense heat that is used to melt precious metal. That's what the word is talking about. The fire that is used to melt precious metal and to prove the metal's genuineness. The intense heat and the melting of the precious metal is to refine and prove that metal. So in the process, the pure and the impure are drawn out from each other. So the impure is called the dross. So in this intense fire ordeal, the pure and the impure are separated the silver and the dross. And Peter here is saying, suffering is a gift of mercy from God in our life because it separates that what is pure and is that what is impure. It's just the natural result of that. We have divided hearts. Why he says that we shouldn't be surprised by suffering is because suffering brings up in our heart that stuff that makes us go, oh, I thought 
it would be easier. I thought finances would be easier. I thought there wouldn't be loss. The fire is the gift of grace that proves our faith. It proves that we get to choose. Only fire in our life can provide this gift of separation of impure from pure. I, um, I don't know if you've ever read the, in the National Psych- Psychology Journal that this fascinating study of people that win the lottery on the happiness scale and people that lose a limb. After a couple months of losing a limb and after a couple months of winning the lottery, the folks that lost a limb are just as happy as the people that have lost, won the lottery. Because the reality is, when we're given an, a, an opportunity, like losing a limb, at losing a job, not playing on the lacrosse field, when we're given, or to walk in our gifting, to face the responsibility and the weight of who we really are and what we really were created for, when we're given the privilege of that fiery ordeal, what happens is the pure remains. The, the pure remains. We suffer, but the silver comes out. The gift card is bought. The lesson is learned. It's always hard. We might be without a limb, but all of a sudden we appreciate life and our family and the sunshine and the grass and the moon in a way we never did before. Um, other ways in the scripture that suffering is referred to, there's these other metaphors. So you have here Peter saying fiery ordeal. Other ways it's talked about is a coach with an athlete, a parent disciplining a child, a vine dresser taking a vine and just chopping it off with metal shears down to bare nothing. And all of those examples, the fire, the parent, the coach, the vine dresser, all of them have suffering in common. But they don't just have suffering in common for in and of itself. They have suffering in common for a greater good. The vine's going to produce more fruit. The athlete's going to become a better athlete. The child is going to understand more about life and God, ultimately the love of God. Isn't that crazy? Through a parent just claiming a child, they then become to know later about the love of God. It's all for a greater good. And you know what's crazy? To the wise eye, this is brilliant. I had that moment again. I tell you this, every time I teach, I have the moment, just like Connor. I have this moment where I just weep when I'm getting ready to teach because it's just so true. It's so real. There's such wisdom in this. But you know what? To the ignorant eye, this is a bunch of baloney. To those who don't know Christ and don't get it, to think of suffering as a good thing, it just doesn't make any sense. They don't get it. They don't get the, the fact that this brings out the best. It seems unfair. It seems not right. How often as Christians do we hear that? It's not right. I told you I was going to say this, and I just want to talk about for a few minutes the things we say to people that are stupid when they're suffering. Um, Partly because I think we learn from this as much. We learn as much from this. And then I'm just going to get to two points from this passage that I want to make. When um, my, my mom died eight years ago, I've talked about her here before, and uh, my dad moved to Baltimore for a couple of years, and then he died five years ago. And I don't know what day of the week he died on. It doesn't matter. It could have been a Tuesday. But that Sunday in church, just days after his death, this person... Um, comes up to me and stands behind me. I probably shouldn't have said this was in church because it doesn't make church look too good, but um, this person comes up and stands behind me and she goes, so what's it like to be an orphan? What the? I mean, really? Like, I was, I, I hadn't even thought of the fact that I was an orphan. It hadn't even gone through my mind. But We say things like that to people when we're suffering. We just say, kind of, we forget the slide in our head that we should just stop it at the bottom before the words come out of our mouth. Um, another thing is we say to our kids we, and we kind of base it on this scripture but we're s- misinterpreting it um, we say to ourselves and our kids sometimes when they're suffering well it's nothing like what Jesus did on the cross 
you know, we mitigate, we, we lessen people's suffering because, well, God, he died on the cross for us. You can handle your stub toe or you're not playing today or whatever because, and we falsely compare. I've done it. I'm guessing you've done it too. And we've probably taught, we've definitely said this to ourselves. Um, we have definitely made the mistake of doing this to ourselves. I have a friend who um, had cancer and she, no, she would notice when people were talking to her that they would say like, well, it's just my husband's job loss. It's not a big deal compared to your cancer. And she finally got to the point where she was like, it's your cancer. St- stop saying that. Everybody's walking around with their own cancer. Whatever your pain is today, it's your pain. It's real. It's real to God and it's real to you. And it's a fiery ordeal that is a gift of mercy that can separate them pure from the impure in our lives. And I won't say, you probably have your own. I have more on my list of dumb things people say, but I'm sure you can fill in your own blanks. But so this passage offers a couple perspectives on suffering that I just want to kind of wrap up with. One is about delayed gratification. My son graduated from high school yesterday, and uh, he, I went home and I watched David McCullough's speech. Two million YouTube viewers have watched it. It's called You Are Not Special. It's wonderful. It's just a high school address of this guy who now is a bestseller by the same title, You're Not Special. But he kind of makes this point in the in his speech, he talks about how we are a hovering parent, ineffectual school, professional college prop, prep, electronic distraction, club sports. He just takes on all of those things in his speech. And he talks about doing something useful with your disadvantages. And he just basically says, look, even if you're one in a million out there, there's still 7,000 of you walking around on the planet. <laughs> like, you're not special. And it's the most brilliant speech in some ways. Um, and it's no doubt why his book is selling so much. Because as a culture, we want everything immediate. We give a trophy for everything. And we're doing a great disservice to our kids to not, and to ourselves, to not letting ourselves suffer. To bypassing this place that God wants us to sit in and not be surprised by. I love that that scripture starts with, do not be surprised. But he never says, you'll never find in Scripture a place that says, do not grieve over your suffering. Over and over it'll say, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised that the impure and the pure needs to be separated, but grieve over it. You were certainly given permission and freedom to be sad. But this whole idea of delayed gratification. Because I'm a teacher, sometimes things happen to me and I think I'm the only one. I do. I mean, that's weird. But when I was changing Connor's diaper, one of the first times I changed my firstborn diaper, I was standing over the diaper changing table and he's crying and I'm, you know, saying it's okay and it'll be better soon and I have to do this. And, and I had this light bulb moment that I thought I was the only person in the universe that ever had this thought of maybe this is what God feels like. Maybe this is what God feels like when I'm in pain and he's going, I get it. There's something better coming. You have to go through this now to get to this place. And I thought I was the only person that ever had this thought about changing a diaper until I heard another speaker say it. And I was like, that's my story. That's my illustration. But, and we've all, parents, we have, if you're a parent here today, you have a little bit of an understanding of suffering, of delayed gratification, because your children go through years of not liking you and thinking you're cruel and inhumane human being. And we can understand delayed gratification because we can understand It's about something longer term and bigger. And we all can understand the the, the delayed gratification that God is calling each one of us to, to walk in these places of saying, not now, but it's coming. So just one, Peter wants his readers to face this reality that suffering is not only inevitable, but it's a part of a higher good. And the second thing um, that he wants us to understand is what the cross offers us in in our suffering. What the solidarity and this connection with the cross is. And I said that some people have wrongly said, there's nothing wrong with knowing and, and thinking about the pain Jesus suffered on the cross. But what Peter wants us to identify with in this passage 
And what God wants us to identify with is the hope and the redemption of the cross. Suffering links us 100% directly to the reality of what Christ purchased on the cross. Let me try to say that a different way. The cross reminds us that any suffering we patiently endure will one day not only end, but there will be redemption, resurrection, and what we now are experiencing will be replaced with, not with what is, but what should have been and what will be. What we are experiencing right now when we're suffering will be replaced one day with what should have been in God's original intent and what will be. Let's go back to our, our examples whether it's a feeling of an unjust coach who won't play you on the field when you know you can perform, or the job situation that is unjust on so many levels, or the transformed life that you're experiencing right now that places you in situations where showing your morality makes you look like an absolute fool. What if, what if the cross looked this way? What if Jesus was whispering these things to me, to Johnny, to Mike? What if Jesus was saying this? I get it. I get it. I get the coach that doesn't understand your potential, the narcissistic boss that's only concerned with what makes him or her look good, and the difficulty of representing me to a world where sex has become a sport and a game. I get it. I died for these things. I long for the day when your experience will match the heavenly reality that all will be made right. You'll play your guts out on the field. Your work and your work hard, and your work won't be in vain. You'll have an opportunity to be fully alive in all of your masculinity, and all of your femininity, with all, all the confusion and lies of this world. What if those are the words of advice and truth, the words that Peter's talking about, we let ourselves listen to and believe? I said I liked um, David McCullough's speech. I liked it, but I hated the way it ended. <laughs> because the reality is we are special. We're special because of what happened on that cross. We're special because something was purchased for us. We're special because when the the reality of the impure being separated from the pure reveals the silver of what we really were created to walk in. We're special. Let's pray. Jesus, what a gift, again, your word is in our lives. Help us today, uh, those of us who have, are, or will suffer, which would be all of us. Help us today to understand the connection between our suffering and the cross of Christ, the redemptive hope, what you purchased, and the kingdom that not only is coming, but has already been ushered in. Help us to walk in that truth today.